together around, as I say, here in the Philippines. And it is with great honor and great pleasure that I'm here with you today. And I would like to really thank Dr. Razal and, and your colleagues for inviting me to this platform. It's a pleasure to meet. And this morning I had an opportunity to walk around the campus. And I'm quite impressed it's a beautiful area. And it's a pleasure to be here again. Um, let me also emphasize that I consider this like a conversation. So please feel invited to interrupt me, perhaps to disagree with me, or to urge me to clarify if need be. And I, I'm also pleased to know that we have some more room for discussion afterwards. So uh, with that, now let me sort of um, invite you, and perhaps by a raise of hands, uh, because I assume all of you are involved in an academic, professional background. So, could I ask you, by the raise of hands, to say, okay, who of you is actually also involved in teaching? Teaching students. So, that's a significant number of people, and I, I see that. And that's also by the raise of hands. Uh, who of you is involved? let's say, in a non-academic capacity in an advisory board or as a trustee on a foundation's board or with the public sector or with government in any kind of advisory capacity which is, let's say, outside of academic scene. Okay, that's interesting to, to know also. So, uh, because that's really close to the topic of my uh, conversation today. So, let me explain a bit why I came to the title of my current presentation and that brings me also to my personal journey. Okay? And I hope I speak loud enough for you to understand. Otherwise please uh, ask me to speak stronger. So let me explain that I have in terms of educational background uh, I got my education at the University of Leiden and for some time at the Indian Institute of Management in India. And I obtained my bachelor's degree in law at the law faculty, and I proceeded with studying political science. Uh, but as the things go in, in Holland, if you study law, you're likely to end up being a lawyer or a diplomat, or you join the corporate sector. But I personally had an interest in ecology. I was interested to understand the workings of politics and in influencing natural resource management. So, I got the opportunity to join the Institute for Environmental Studies and to the Diploma in Environmental Studies. And some of you may know that the University of Leiden had a long-term collaboration of more than 20 years with Isabella State University in the north. And I'm pleased to say that this collaboration has been extremely fruitful and highly appreciated in the Netherlands also. So with the College for uh, Forestry and Environmental Management here in the Philippines, in the Isabella State University, there was the Cayagan Valley Program on Environmental Development, the CVPAT for short. Sure. And I can tell you there are many professionals in the Netherlands uh, which, are, which entered the government or corporate sector or non-governmental sector who got their kind of full submergence and built disciplinary approaches to natural resource management up in North Luzon. So we are still grateful for that exposure. Very helpful. And so multidisciplinary approaches to science. I think that's one element I would like to emphasize in my, in my presentation. So I myself uh, had the opportunity to conduct field work in India. Whereas Madam said, I was able to study the function of the State Forest Service. And then I spent quite some time in a draw prone area more towards the center of the country in India, in South India, doing comparative analysis between different villages on their systems of natural resource management and how the management is really influenced by political context. Um, now, after my return to Holland in 1989, my professor uh, suggested I take on a PhD. 
expanding my research in the functioning of the state forest service in India. And as you can imagine, that was a very tempting and very generous offer. But I was very much in the dilemma also, because at the time I was witnessing the huge deforestation in India and in the region. So I was sort of impatient, as your men tend to be. They are impatient, they want action. So I, so I said to my professor that I said, well, instead, I found this opportunity to join the organization on both ends. Now, I say organization, but at that time, it was more like a small project. It was a small project started at the, the wings of the Netherlands Committee for ICN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources. And it was a small project. We had a few tables, we had one computer, and often we, we had many ambitions. So we really tried to be like an intermediary, like a matchmaker, to support civil society organizations, the Global South and the former Soviet Union, to build bridges with the corporate sector, with the academic sector, and with the government sector. Because the civil society was often working in isolation, and they needed support. So for me that was a huge challenge. And so for me that was a journey also to start action research program with the scientific sectors. Um, now being involved in action research, uh, I think we jointly faced two huge challenges. So the one challenge uh, let me move to the next slide. The, next, the one challenge is how we can build bridges between the different scientific disciplines. Because as we all know, uh, and that's a common phenomenon, uh, we have a faculty of law, we have a faculty of economics and accounting, we have a faculty of biology. Scientific data which are not 
accessible, but which are too complicated, are ignored, which is a pity because we need science to inform policy decisions as we all know. So now if we would limit ourselves to the domain of natural resource management, okay, which is a kind of common feature we have here before us. So on the one hand, we may accept there is a sort of disconnect between the scientific disciplines and there is a sort of disconnect between science and the arenas of decision making and action. So I think it's it's fair to ask ourselves, okay, what is the cause of that disconnect? Now, and, and I've been involved for in the past two and a half decades in various research programs, uh, many of which are funded by the European Communion community. So these are often large consortia of many universities. And sometimes we as an NGO are being invited to join that consortium. Now, and we then witness that um, for the academics in Europe to start this, to survive professionally, um, they are being wrecked, the universities are being wrecked and rewarded for the number of publications in peer-reviewed, high prestigious academic journals. So, we witness that scientists are in the red race to secure funding and to get their articles sort of accepted. So there's this kind of competitive arena and, and as we say it's either publish or perish. If you don't publish, you don't get your funds, you don't get your rewards. So and that's rather a pervert system. I'm, I'm very frank with you again. Because it not necessarily leads to scientific efforts being appreciated by society and being used by society. So, and again, I mean, I'm all in favor of having these articles be published and be peer reviewed and be scrutinized, but it should not be the only measure by which science is being appreciated and rewarded. I think there are more measures to, to go by. Um, and, and Bear with me, I'm saying the same mantra, make it my own country. <laughs> and I'm very outspoken there because uh, people get impatient. Now, um, and my colleague in the scientific community, they tell me that because of this web base, they have little time for teaching, so students suffer, and they have little time to be involved in, let's say, extra academic. Uh, involvement like the boards or an advisory councils and all that. And it's a pity because we need those experts that can imagine. So that brings me also to the funders. And like the European Commission, it's globally one of the largest funders of scientific research. So that's good news. They have these five year cycles, large framework programs. It's a multi million program, billions. But the European Commission is very focused on innovation and excellence. That's their measure of evaluating proposals, high competitive standards. They pay little attention, yes, lip service, but in fact little attention to, let's say, to what extent the scientific community is encouraged and is expected to reach out to their potential clients, which is the non-governmental sector, governments, corporate sector. So the end users of the same science. So, and, and that's from personal experience. We have these five cycle programs, which sounds like reasonable, but if you want to change things, and you know that as much as I do, foresters, agriculture, we need long term horizons to understand see how insights can be adopted in change strategies and then use. Five years is nothing. So after our program is finished and the scientific research has really sort of served as useful data, there's no time left. 
and scientists have to run to other projects to make a living. And, and that is sad. And scientists are frustrated about it. And uh, so it's like a stop-go situation. So that's something for us just to bear in mind. Now also, the clients of research, and I'm one of the clients also, uh, we need to be questioned by our own conduct. Because the clients, whether it's the corporate sector or NGOs, governments, often we pay little time to accompany scientists in phrasing the research agenda that where it starts. So what are societal needs to phrase the research agenda? And by and large, clients spend little time reviewing the many good data which are coming out of research. So why do we ask scientists to do research if we don't scrutinize, review, read the data? I mean, this is a fact of life. Ask any scientist in Europe, they will <laughs> make this comment. And we know the shelf life of academic publications is rather short. So it seems like pity. And now, of course, the key question is how academics and practitioners can sit together and ensure, ensure that academic data, which are often highly complex, it's, it's hard work, years of data collection, analysis, that the results can be translated in a format which is understandable to policymakers or to NGOs. We do not have the kind of scientific background or do not have, not have the time to be involved in that kind of research. So, the issue of translation. So, the challenge is how can we avoid that the many good PhD student, uh, studies postdoc studies, master thesis, scientific articles are sort of archived and left in anonymity. So how can we build bridges to sort of unlock those islands of wisdom? I mean, that's the key question we need to have. Unlocking those repositories of knowledge. I think that's what I feel very passionate about. Now, the past 10 minutes, I may have painted a rather grim picture, and I think we have challenges, but I also would like to contradict myself in the same lecture, because we all witness there are excellent examples of where scientists and practitioners work together, and I would like to sort of invite you to accompany to some of those examples, because I feel quite excited about them. Um, and once again, I mean, it's about collaboration, but allowing scientists to remain loyal to, let's say, common rules of scientific integrity and scientific rigor, because that's quite crucial. Now, I would like to quote a former Minister of Environment, Professor Jacqueline Kamers. I think she made an important statement. I mean, she's a scientist. Okay? She was in government. She was on the board of Shell, the, the oil company. So she has her one feet in the science community, the other feet in the practical arena. And she said, well, we need mission-driven science. And we have to acknowledge that value-free science is often an illusion. So let's accept that. Value-free science being an illusion. Mission-driven science. What, what could that mean? Um, and hopefully, I, I can expand a bit on that, and we can have some conversation about it. Like Mission-driven science. And um, last week, uh, our professor Ben Feringa is a chemist. He got the Nobel Prize for his research in nanotechnology. So, uh, Feringa throughout his career, so alongside doing research, which is now being rewarded, he was always made it a point to teach first and sec second year graduate students. That's where his passion still is. And he made in his, let's say, acceptance speech a strong statement saying, well, the academic community needs to be allowed 
more space for experimentation. And also younger generations of students, academics, to be allowed to involve themselves to find solutions for pressing societal problems. And they need freedom for that. Also in terms of fundamental research. So I think that's, that, that's two statements I would like to, to emphasize. So mission-driven science, as well as allowing scientists freedom an arena where they can experiment and find solutions for pressing societal problems. So what, are, what triggers scientists to spend all that time in the lonely hours in scientific research? Um, now, a, a very uh, inspiring example of obviously is the United Nations Convention to Climate Change, to combat climate change, UNCCC. So we have an intergovernmental panel on climate change. And fortunately, we have all the scientists, huge hard labor. And their reports could not be ignored by our governments. And this now has led to the Climate Accord in Paris. Without the scientists, this would not have been possible. So this is a huge success. And another huge effort is the United Nations. Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. In three volumes, it's, it's a beautiful piece of work for the scientists explaining to the world the state of the current natural resource systems, the degradation of drylands, the destruction of wetlands, the state of the forests, and what we done about it. So it's a whole menu of actions recommended by the scientists in that panel. Now, if we talk about climate change, and that's obvious um, an issue which in the Philippines is reality. So, uh, before this lecture we were discussing the hurricanes and the typhoons striking in the Philippines. And, of course, this, this is a feature which is, let's say, it's part of life here in the Philippines, but it's changing because of climate change. And it's getting more erratic, and it has a huge impact on society here. I mean, in Europe, we read about the situation in the Philippines regularly. Now, you can imagine that in parts of Africa, similar climate impacts uh, strike. Um, and let me take you to Sub-Saharan Africa to the country of Niger, which is in the very center of the African continent. So it's bordering Nigeria, Chad, Mali. Um, Algeria. And in a sense, Niger is, according to the statistics, the least developed country in the world. It's suffering from regular food shortages, malnutrition and even starvation. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite a serious situation out there. At the same time, you might be surprised that the parts of Niger offer us a really a, a very inspiring example of probably the largest positive transformation of land use in human history. And my colleagues of the University the University of Amsterdam showed me, they said, well, we have been conducting more than 40 years of research in Niger, but somehow it's only recently that we detected how in these remote areas bordering the Nigerian country, in the provinces of Zinder and Maradi, that we have seen in the course of 10 to 25 years how the landscape, which is a barren, the eroded landscape, has been transformed back into a forested landscape because of farmers. Farmers taking the lead in allowing the natural regeneration of the endemic trees and bushes to take place. 
And as you can imagine, uh, Niger is hit by sandy storms, heavy sand erosion. So this country needs buffers, physical buffers. Time-wise, I will uh, keep that in mind. So, what here happened is that because of a consortium of scientists, practitioners, with some modest external funding, farmers were encouraged to take their fate in their own hand. And planting trees on that scale is virtually impossible, especially if we consider it's only 400 to 450 millimeters of rain. So we have to work with nature. So to allow the underground forest of seeds, stems and roots to sprout up again. So these farmers uh, created agreements amongst themselves in the villages and also with pastoralist herdsmen that they would allow this spontaneous regrowth of seedlings to flourish and not to use the axe or allow goats or other animals to erase that. that uh, so it, well, this is not the same area, but you can imagine this kind of transformation could take place as you've seen in the satellite imagery in the previous slide. So, inspired by this transformation, uh, we started collaboration with the University of Niamey, the Center for Agricultural Education and Research and Extension, CRESA. And CRESA was instrumental in uh, sort of replicating this approach now in other municipalities or towards the east of the country. And we got funding from the Tom Tom car navigation system for over seven years now and we are now expanding this program. So in other municipalities some 80 village communities have been formed stretching 370,000 hectares and with the scientists there we did in-depth monitoring of 11,000 hectares now being sort of under forest canopy cover again. And you might be pleased to notice that the scientists there said, well, we have really, over the last seven years, an increase because of closing forest canopy. Of course, it takes a lot of time to dry, uh, dry ecology reason. But they have been experiment, uh, experiencing recharge water tables in wells and ponds, uh, yield increases from 100 kilos to 350 kilos per hectare of millets and sorghum. So that's a tremendous increase because of improved microclimate conditions and improved soil conditions because of organic matter of the biomass. And you also see now, and that's what we are now doing with participatory monitoring with the farmers, what, what it means for the household then. So more food, better fuel wood, position for women especially. They can now sell timber case of shortages, or if there is illness in the family, they can sell a tree, a timber, etc. Et More fodder for the tree, for the, for the cattle. So here you see on the right hand, uh, this is uh, Professor Tudu, he's the director of the uh, center at the University of Niamé, with my colleague Chris Rijen of the Free University of Amsterdam. Uh, and they are leading now a consortium of NGOs and government agencies. And because of the high prestige of Professor Tudu in Niger, now the government is gradually adopting this strategy of working with nature. So let me move on back to Asia. And uh, what we see here is former forest land. Uh, this is taken in Sarawak in Malaysia. Um, this land is now converted to palm oil extension. And as we know, uh, palm oil is a key revenue earner in Asia. And it's providing millions of jobs in the plantation sector, in the downstream refinery, manufacturing. So it's an important economic driver, I mean, there's no denial. And it's a very cheap vegetable oil also. Um, 
At the same time, we acknowledge that the World Economic Forum in 2030, uh, they alerted the global society saying, well, it's one of the drivers of deforestation. It's a main emission of GHG gases. So the climate change is a factor to, to regulate. Um, it's also associated with serious land conflicts, land grab and all that. Um, and more so, we see that now in Indonesia, where an increasing number of uh, districts is now net food importer because of the extension of palm oil, monoculture plantations. So what to do? How to regulate the palm oil sector? And as Madam with the introduction mentioned the RSPO, yes, in 2005, Gosets uh, journey round table sustainable palm oil. And since 2014, I, I serve on the Board of Governors. So I'm wrapping up now, and I'm coming to some conclusions. Because here again, in the RSPO sector, we, also, we now work with the scientific community. So we have uh, engaged a consortium of scientists called Sensor to really assist the RSPO to measure whether we are making any progress in halting deforestation. So the RSPO is 3,000 companies, so plantation companies, brands like Unilever, Nestle, and the major banks. So are we able, because of our certification standard, because we are a brand and also certification platform, to regulate the sector? It is also, and I would like to emphasize, it offers good career opportunities because we need people with a scientific background to do assessments of high conservation value of forest, where hopefully the plantation sector will not expand. We need social scientists to help this resolve that conflict between companies and communities. We need auditors and the potential. And a quick step back to the Philippines. And Dr. Rosal and I, we got to know each other through the non timber forest products exchange program. And I feel this is one example. It's a network operating in six countries. It has 60 members, NGOs, people from the academic sector, work with more than 600 communities in establishing sustainable extraction of non timber forest products. And I've been witnessing scientists and representatives from local communities working for long hours in, for instance, developing protocols for sustainable harvesting. I think it's very exciting. And, and good manuals have come out of that. And I'm now sort of reaching the end of my story here, and this is about the young generation. Um, with our own hands. There's the title of a volume. It weighs two and a half kilos. It's a huge volume. And uh, produced by a few colleagues of mine, ethnobotanists in the Afghanistan and Tanjik Pamir Mountains. And for 10 years they worked with local communities to document in their local languages the rich history of tree products and local grain varieties, establishing over 400 varieties of apples, 300 varieties of apricots. 150 varieties of grains. But all that knowledge is stored in local languages. And as we know, the local languages are rapidly disappearing. So that's a tragedy. We need to address this priority. And the elderly people say, the young generation is moving to the cities. How can we hold on to the young generation in our communities? How can we have cross-generational transfer of that knowledge? It's a vital challenge. So food, culture, language, ecosystems. That should be our mantra, I feel. And this book is in three languages. It's in Dari Persian, it's in Tajik, and it's in English. Huge effort. And by the way, it won the global prize for the best cookie book. Because it contains hundreds of recipes. Especially elderly ladies ask them, can you please document our recipes? Because they get lost on the way. So yes, the youth is the torchbearers of the future. And just wrapping up now, there are a number of examples 
uh, for instance, one of our founders, she died eight years ago and she was an international diplomat. She was director of the UN Climate Bureau. And when her husband died and she died, to our surprise, she left Bozit her whole estate, which is about over two million euros. And she had just one small request to make that we invested in the next generation. So that's what we did. We have a scholarship program. And people can enroll in our academic efforts, they can enroll in grassroots training, they can enroll in environment diplomacy, whatever helps young people to be of use to their communities and their societies. Like so, we have now a small fund in India, which is the next regeneration fund. And, and I can extend on that, which is now gradually supported by Indian Campus of Industry, who also acknowledge we need professionals with this kind of exposure to natural resource management for the future of India. So yes, we have to build coalitions between the scientific disciplines, and I'm sort of getting to my opening uh, statement, and between <coughs> the scientific community and the practitioners. And that we allow ourselves uh, to work in tandem, and that we allow ourselves uh, to bring us back uh, to, to an appreciation of the natural environment in which we live. I mean, basically, that's where our water comes from, our food comes from, and our health comes from. And whether you are a civil engineer, a diplomat, a banker, an agricologist or forest, it doesn't matter. We all need the natural environment. So how can we inspire the other sectors of society to take on board that message? Building bridges. Thank you so much.